So the event we're going to look at, um, the different guys that wrote about Jesus' life, they all record uh, a version of this. John doesn't, but, but Matthew does. He was there when this happened. Uh, Mark, who's telling us what Peter remembers from there, he's, he tells us, Luke tells us a little piece of this. They have a little bit different versions. But, but it all happens, and it all happens fairly late. Jesus has now been probably teaching about three years, or maybe a little bit more. Things are starting to wind down. Um, and his disciples come to him with a question that they, they, if you've read much about the stories of Jesus' closest followers, you know that they continually ask a really, really important question, at least a really important question to them. And so that's where we're going to pick it up today over in Matthew chapter 18. And, and Matthew, as he remembers, it simply says this, that the followers that came to Jesus and they asked Jesus this question. And here's the big question that they regularly ask of Jesus and it's such a big, big, important question for them. Here's what Jesus' closest followers after all these years of being with him want to know. Who? Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven, Right? And when he talks about kingdom of heaven, they're not talking about going, you know, in heaven, who's the greatest, because they know God's the greatest there. We're talking about here on earth, this kingdom that you're bringing in, this this new thing that you're changing, this such a countercultural move, this this idea that you're going to come and be the Messiah, and you're going to, you know, get rid of the Romans. Who who in that kingdom, Jesus, is going to be the greatest? And they all expect an answer like this. Well, of course, guys, you are, Right? That's what they're waiting for, at least. And there may be even hope, and not only we say you guys, but they'll kind of point at somebody and say, you especially, right? And they're, just, they're waiting for that moment because they're wanting to know, you know, hey, when this all happens, it sounds like it's getting closer. Jesus, what about us? You're not going to forget about us, right? So Jesus, who? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? To which Jesus has a wonderful response. Matthew says what he does, Jesus doesn't say anything. He simply sees a kid somewhere around them, and I don't know if this is the whole crowds gather around him or they just have stopped someplace or this is just a question that pops up and there's some kids around. But Jesus finds a little kid and he calls him over and he stands him in the midst of his closest followers. And he kind of, ta-da, to which I think they all go, did you not understand the question, Jesus? We want to know who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What's this kid got to do with it, right? But Jesus puts him there. And they all kind of look at each other and look at Jesus, and now they're thinking, oh no, because when Jesus does this kind of stuff, it never goes well for us, right? right. And so then Jesus looks at the guys and says, hey guys, let me tell you the truth, right? You must change, you must turn, you guys, my closest followers, you gotta turn, you gotta change and become like little children. To which they all think, what in the world is he talking about? I mean, what, does he want to be like childlike? I mean, what, what, what does that even mean? Do we have to turn and be like this little kid? And we don't know how old this kid is, but it says little kid, so we assume that he's a littler kid than kind of a medium-sized kid. And I imagine the kid's like, you know, what's going on? I mean, just, he's just being a kid, right? He's just sitting there. But Jesus goes on and says, listen, he even ups the game. He says, listen, otherwise you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Guys, if you don't turn this thing, you don't change how you're thinking about things, change about how you approach life, you don't have to worry about who's the greatest because you won't be there. Which is like, whoa, time out, Jesus. <laughs> we'll take our, we didn't quite ask the question quite right. All right, let's change the dynamics here because we don't want to be on the outside. We, we were just kind of curious about where we might fit on the inside, but as long as we're on the inside, we're good, right? And then Jesus goes even farther. He says, listen, guys, the greatest person, the greatest person in the kingdom of heaven is the one who makes himself humble and becomes like this little child. Amen. Amen. And what Jesus recognizes is something that we often don't recognize, especially in our own lives. He, recognized, he, he looked at them and he thought, you know, you guys, you're, you're all stuck. You're all stuck on position. You're all stuck on prestige. You're all stuck on power. That's what you're stuck on. And let's be honest, that's an easy thing to get stuck on, isn't it? I mean, because who wouldn't like a better position? Anybody not want a better position than you currently have? Right? Who wouldn't want some more prestige than you currently have? And let's be honest, we all like a little bit more power, right? Or maybe a lot more power, because power is like powerful. And Jesus is like, guys, you're stuck. And the only way to get around this, notice he said, the one who makes himself humble or makes herself humble 
Jesus is talking about a choice, a, a, an intentional way of turning, an intentional way of rethinking how we think about us. In fact, I, I ran across a, a definition of humble years ago that I, that I think was so apropos to what Jesus, when he talks about make yourself humble means. It, it said this, that humble is not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking less about ourselves. Because sometimes we get in our mind that humble is like this. Oh, woe is me. I'm, I'm just the poorest, weakest. I don't have anything to offer. I'm terrible. That's not what humble is. Humble is you're, you're who you are, but, but you don't think who you are is so much better than anybody else's who they are. In fact, you don't think too much about yourself. And that seems to be what Jesus is saying. You know, kids just kind of, you know, sometimes they feel they're great. Sometimes they don't feel they're great. But, but kids just kind of are. And then Jesus adds one more point to it all. He says, listen, oh, by the way, if, it, if you aren't clear on any of this, let me make it even less clear. Whoever accepts, whoever welcomes a child in my name, whoever accepts one of these little kids, you know, sort of as my representative, they end up accepting me. And Jesus is pointing out to them something that wasn't just only easy to forget and miss 2,000 years ago. It's even something that we at times can miss now. And that's the importance and the value of kids. Because back then, kids weren't valuable until they were valuable, until they added some value to life. Until they could do some chores, until they could do some work, they could bring in some money, they could support the family, right? You know, you have a lot of kids so that you can get more things done. Not necessarily because you love kids. And sometimes, let's be honest, it's a little hard at times to value our kids. I mean, you know your kids. I've seen some of your kids. You know your kids. And I know you love your kids, and I love your kids. But kids are... Our kids, right? There's your deep thought for the day. But kids are kids, right? And kids do childish stuff. They do kid stuff. But there is something about kids who, who are the ability to live in the moment and just kind of be there and engage and kind of fully in and not really worrying about too much other stuff. So Jesus has said to these guys, listen, you came to me with this really important question, at least important, important question to you. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, right? Who's, who's going to be the greatest, Jesus, when you set this thing up? And Jesus reminds them that if that's their attitude, they're not going to have to worry about who's the greatest. They might just miss out on this whole thing. Which, if you haven't read about much about what Jesus says, that may kind of seem like a shock because it's like, well, did hear it, Mike? I thought Jesus always loves us and cares about us, right? Compassion, you know, you're disgrace, and you know, it just everything's gonna be okay. But the reality is sometimes things aren't okay. And sometimes the only way to face those things that aren't okay is to be told those things aren't okay. But then Jesus takes a twist after saying, Hey, you gotta be like this kid, and you gotta you gotta welcome this kid because that's like welcoming me. Then Jesus says something that really catches them all off guard. Listen, if, if someone, causes, someone causes one of these little children who believes in me to stumble, to, to lose their faith, if somebody does something to, to break that faith that they have in me, to damage that faith, it would be better for that person to have a large stone, a millstone tied around their neck. This is the thing that a donkey drug around and, and uh, crushed up grain with. This is a big old millstone. I've got to watch my language. Big, big old millstone, right? tied around the neck and be drowned that is thrown in the depths of the sea. It's like, whew, that got dark fast, didn't it? I mean, the guys are thinking, we, we were wondering who was going to be the greatest and now we're like, whoa, right? You got this little kid that we're like, what is this kid doing here? And it's just a kid, it doesn't matter. And Jesus is saying, no, no, this kid's really valuable in fact so much that if we do something to damage this kid, hurt this kid, it's better that if we tie the thing around and we're going to drown ourselves. And what if, what if the greatest is the one who looks out for others? What if the, the greatest is the one that actually doesn't, look out, doesn't just look out, but actually cares out for others? 
What if the greatest is the one who considers what the things they say, what the things they do, and how that's going to impact these little kids? And I don't know about you. I'm actually glad that Jesus said this. Because I'm glad that we have a God who says some things are over the line. And that when you mess with kids, when you hurt kids, when you damage kids, I'm glad there's some consequences where that there should be. It's one of those moments I'm glad that isn't like, well, just ask me to forgive you and you're all good. Jesus seems to change the game here and I can't explain all this because you know, we kind of wrap our minds around certain aspects of what we believe, what picture of God is. This just adds a whole new dimension to our picture of God. Yes, yes. Jesus says, you know, if, you gotta, if you're doing something bad to kids, you ought to just go kill yourself. Not just kill yourself. You know, get this big boulder, drag yourself out and put yourself where it's, it's done done for you. Which seems so harsh. But, but, but what if it's harsh because Jesus knows how harsh it is for those kids? Let's go back to the story. Let's get that's kind of dark. Let's go right here. I wish the story got better, but Jesus kind of just keeps going. And then he says this, woe, woe to, how terrible for the world. And woe is not, isn't really terrible. It's more of a language of sort of this, this sad, depressing I feel bad that this happened. Woe to them because it's, it's nothing you can do about it. Woe to the world that because of the stumbling blocks, the things that caused them to sin. Woe, woe to just everybody in the world, whether you're religious or not religious. We all know, we all know something. And that's there's things that trip us up in life. And sometimes there are things that we did that trip us up. Sometimes it's something somebody else did. Sometimes it's just sort of an accidental thing that trips us up, but that gets us started and going in a direction where we end up kind of stumbling more and more. And Jesus says, I've, I say, whoa, I, I, it's terrible. I feel how sad, how sad it is for the world. And he's talking about people. How sad it is for people like us. That stuff like that has to happen. And it's one of those, again, reminders of our picture of God. And we say, well, why would God allow that? And apparently there's a reason that he allows that. But it doesn't make him happy. He's just, it's there. He goes on and says, listen, such, such things will happen. Things are going to happen. But how terrible for, how woe to the one who causes them to happen. And he's back to the idea again about when we, when we intentionally do something, when we do something, it causes something else. And this, Jesus is simply reminding us of something that we all know. And it's this. Right? Should be a bumper sticker. Because stuff does happen, doesn't it? I mean, all of us have had stuff happen. Or I've, it's, you know, it just, and again, it comes in lots of different ways. But Jesus' very clear point is simply this. Don't be the one who causes stuff to happen. I mean, it's going to happen, but don't, don't you be the cause of all that. Don't you be somebody's regret. Don't you be part of somebody's bad story, sad story. Don't be the one that damages their faith. To which you begin to think about it, he's talking to all of us, isn't he? Ever been part of somebody's regret? I mean, sometimes we're part of our own regret, but sometimes we're, we've been part of somebody else's regret. Sometimes we're the cause of what happened to them because we kind of pushed them to come join us that night and go do that thing, and then that thing went sideways, didn't go like that thing was supposed to go because things don't always go like they're supposed to go. And now it's just a mess. And this is one of those moments when 
when I look back and think about being there in that group when Jesus is talking, I wanted the disciples just like, oh, Jesus, just please stop at some point. This is getting worse and worse for us, right? Because they know the tension between the group. There's been times when that group, it isn't like every follower of Jesus back then was just like, ah, oh, yes, Jesus, you know, everything's great, you know? There was problems between them, right? They got in discussions. They got in those kind of heated discussions, right? They had different views, different opinions, they got irritated with each other. I mean, you would too if you were like camped out for like a long, long, long time, right? I mean, how many of you don't even like camping? Anybody else with me? Yeah. I like the concept of camping. I just don't like the reality of camping, right? It sounds so wonderful until you're out there and it's dusty and it's dirty and your air mattress never holds air all night long. I don't know how I got off of that, but let's get back to this, right? <laughs> so don't be the one that stuff happens from, right? And then Jesus doubles down. Here's where he goes, right? Just stop, Jesus. Oh, no, no. Let me go on, guys. Let me just tell you guys, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, causes you to lose faith, that's the context here, not just sort of stumble, but, but it causes you to lose faith, cut it off and throw it away. I want you to know that Jesus is using hyperbole here. Because what would your foot do to cause you to lose faith? Now, maybe you heard it and it's, you know, it's something happened to it. It's not healing right. You're saying, God, heal it, make it better. But it really, I'm going to cut it off. That's going to help better. But don't miss the point. Jesus is being serious. He's, he's talking like, you know, he's, he's coming across in this way really strong. He's saying, listen, if it's your hand or your foot that's causing you to stumble, that's causing you to lose faith, cut it off and throw it away. Then he makes this incredible statement. It is better for you to lose part of your body and live forever than to have two hands and two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. Which is like, wow, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if we, they got Jesus on a bad day because he just seems to be going for it, doesn't it? I mean, I mean you look at this and you gotta say, why, why such extreme measures? Why, why go there? Why not you know, deal with whatever your issue is? But no, hand, foot, cut it off. Better to go through life crippled, not whole, than to, than to miss out. Yes, yes. But let me ask you a what if question. What if, what if Jesus cares more about us than we do at times? Because aren't there times when you're like, mm, I know I shouldn't, yes. but... Because here's the reality of all of us. This is just a people thing. This is not just a religious thing, but it but works for religious people just like it does, you know, for, for those of us that aren't very, you know, religious or very religious. And that's that we can talk ourselves into anything. Right? I mean, some of us are really good at justifying, like anything. Even stuff that we know is wrong. Yeah, have you ever been in the midst of explaining something you know you're wrong and you just double down? Anybody else with me on that? Because you're like too far along in the discussion, you're like, I can't stop now. I'm just, I'm just going for it all, baby, right? In fact, even as I think about it, it sounds like a really dumb idea, but no, 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 because I really want to do this thing. And you just kind of blow past all the stop signs, all the stoplights, all the speed bumps, all the stumbling things, and just keep going. Yes, yes. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, oh, by the way, if your eye causes you to stumble, if it causes, your eye causes you to lose faith, take it, gouge it out, and throw it away. Because, by the way, it's better for you to have only one eye and what's the words there? And live forever than to have two eyes and be thrown into the Gehenna of fire. And actually, when Jesus makes this statement, he's, he, is, he is bringing in their whole Jewish background. He's bringing in a reality of what happens even in their moment. Because Gehenna was actually a, a, a real literal place. It's on the south side of, of Jerusalem. Which you know, like South Side in most places, that's like, oh, the South Side, right? <laughs> it was the place that, that hundreds of years before, when, when the Israelites, when the, when the Jewish people had decided that the one God 
wasn't enough. They, they thought some other gods might have some options. And so there was a pagan god they began to follow. And the way you follow this particular pagan god was, wait for it, you sacrificed your children. You took them to the spot and you burned them. Now, I don't know how somebody comes up with their mind that this is a great idea. What kind of God you have to believe in to, to think that's, that's the way to make this God happy, to get them to do what you want them to do. But that's what they did. And so what happened is this spot became a place that was just viewed from, the, from their perspective as cursed. It was one of those bad places that when you go there, you don't, you know, you just get a sense that this was a bad spot. I don't know if you've, any of you have ever been to any of the um, Holocaust sites. I mean, but just going to a Holocaust museum at times can have that feeling, but I've been to a, a couple of different actual sites. And literally there is this feeling when you walk in this, on these grounds that something bad happened here. And maybe it's just, you know, how our minds work and we kind of make that stuff up, but, but there's just this stark, weird feeling like this is not a good spot. And that's what this was. In fact, what had happened, the way they responded, the way the Jewish people responded years later as, as the time went on, they turned it into a, a, a garbage dump. You know, it was a bad place, and so you just throw garbage on it. That's, that's how you try to sort of you can't use it for anything else because it's such a bad place. You throw garbage out there. And back then, the way you dealt with garbage is you threw your garbage and you would light fires to, you know, burn up the garbage so that, you know, it kept going away and the smells were bad, but at least it wasn't piling up higher and higher. At some point, you got in control of it. And Jesus is using a very interesting thing here when he says, you know, it's better, better to throw your eyes out than to be thrown into this, this, this spot where the fires are always going, always burning. This, this terrible thing that reminds us of how, what we did to kids before which is why I think he brings it up. Because again, he's talking about little kids. And may even be talking about people whose faith is like a little child's. And here's Jesus' point. It's better to throw some things out of our life than to have our life be a waste. And here's what I know about you. You all know that's true. Your struggle and my struggle is actually living like that's true. I mean, Jesus is simply saying, listen, if there's something we have control over that has the potential to trip us up, deal with it before it deals with us. It's better, it's better to throw things out of our life than for our life to be thrown into chaos. Because I'm guessing that if not all of us, at least some of us have had our lives thrown into chaos because of some stuff that we just wouldn't let go of. I mean, let's think about it. Aren't there, aren't there things we wish we could go back and throw out of our life? Yeah. You know, things that we have regrets about or things we have regrets about because we were somebody else's regret. Things that we wish we had never done, never responded to. You know, things like that phone number that you had and you had for a long time. And it's like, I shouldn't call it, but you did. And when you did, that set in cycle of what happened after it, which also what happened after it. And now you're dealing with the aftermath of it all. Or that, that text, right? Hey, at three o'clock in the morning. And you're like, uh, but then you responded. Maybe it was that trip. You know, that trip you took. It was supposed to be a business trip, but some other stuff happened and life just kind of went off rails. And now you're even today are kind of living with the results of choices and decisions you made on that trip. Maybe it's, maybe it's that spring break. Because some of us got some spring break stories. We're not going to talk about them here, all right? I'm just saying we got some spring break stories, all right? For some of us, it may, be, uh, may have been that first sip or that first taste. 
Maybe for some of us, it's, it's that job opportunity. You know, the one they told you everything's going to be fine. No, no, you don't have to worry about that. We'll give you time off for that. You know, you, you go to church on Saturday. We'll give you time off. That won't be an issue. You know, ethically, you know, we follow all these rules. And then you, you discovered, no, none of that was true. But it was such a great opportunity, right? It was a chance to move along. It seemed like a blessing from God. And now it's like, no. I mean, isn't it true that we have people and stuff that we wished we'd cut out sooner? And the reality is, we wish we had. We really wish we had. But we didn't. And here we are. And here's a place that we don't, we're not comfortable being, but it's where we ended up because of of some things we weren't willing to let go of. Cut out. And I want you to understand, I'm not saying that that's simple and easy, because I know it isn't. But here's what I do know, at least about my own stuff. It would have been so much simpler and easier the first time than the next time or the next time or as things went off the rail and having to deal with all those things. And now it's a, not an easy thing. It's a big, big thing. And for those of us that, that come at it from a faith perspective, you know, we, we've, we've prayed to God, we've asked God to, to forgive us for those things, to heal those things, to, to get them out of our lives. And sometimes it's like, no, but, but it keeps staying and I, I don't know what to do with it all. Let me, I just want to put a thought in your mind. It's going to sound kind of maybe some harsh and maybe critical and that's not my intention here. My intention is, is for all of us to just think for a moment about those things. What if, what if when we ask God to take this from us, God is wondering when we'll let go of it. And again, I just want us to think about if that could be a possibility of why it hasn't when we've prayed for it too. And again, I'm not trying to be simplistic, but I'm com I come from a, from a faith perspective. Faith in a God who can do the impossible. The question is, will he? And the question is, sometimes, will we? All right, that's dark enough. Let's go back to, uh, back to Jesus, all right? It actually gets, gets a little better going out. So everybody kind of take a deep breath. We're done with all the dark stuff. We're going to be a little happier now, right? So Jesus says, hey, well, well before we get there, be careful. <laughs> be careful. Uh, don't think that these little children are worth nothing. Don't despise them. Don't look down on one of these little boys. He's talking to the guys. Specific context, right? He's saying, guys, I know when, I, when you ask me this question, hey, Jesus, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who's going to be, you know, close to you? And I, and I brought this child. You're all like, oh, I'm Jesus, just a kid, right? And it's just a kid. And how quickly we write off kids. And Jesus says, don't. Got to be careful about that. Because the reality is, all of us, all of us have memories from our childhood. And some of those memories are ones that have stuck with us for a long, long time. Some of them are really good, hopefully. Some of them aren't so good, truthfully. And sometimes what the picture we got then becomes the picture that gets hardened, which becomes the picture that we carry through life. And sometimes it's hard to change that picture because that picture is so set in our minds. But she says, listen, don't, don't think they're, they're worth it. Don't, don't look down on, on kids, right? 
Yeah, they're not as serious as you guys. No, nah, not devoted as you guys. But that doesn't change their value. See, because you think their value is when they become valuable, when they can contribute something. I'm telling you they're valuable just simply because they're kids. In fact, he goes on and says, listen, I'm going to tell you that, that they, you're, these kids, that you kind of kind of wonder about, don't think they're so important. They have angels in heaven who are always with, that is, they see the face of my father in heaven. They got their own angels. Now, I don't know if that means if you get past a certain age, you don't have angels. He doesn't get into that discussion, all right? But he's saying, hey, you kind of just push them upside. They're not important. They're before the age of accountability, which they would have believed that you had to get, you know, 12, you become a, in the Jewish system, you become an adult, become a man, you become a woman, which is a whole other crazy thought. But the idea before that, you're nothing. And he's saying, no, no, well before that, there's something. And then Jesus, I think, takes a breath. He looks at the guys and he asks them an interesting question. He says, hey guys, what do you think? To which I think they all look at each other like, hey, I don't know what to think. And B, if I said what I'm thinking, I'm going to be wrong because it's like, I was clearly wrong when we started off with the question. <laughs> Jesus, who's the greatest, right? I mean, <laughs> I'm going to leave that one alone. I, I don't know, Jesus. What, what, what do you think? But Jesus then tells a story that if you've been around a place like this, you've heard, but you've probably heard it in a different context. And it's a reminder that Jesus taught for over three years. And we don't have everything recorded that he thought because oftentimes I believe that he repeated stories. That sometimes he keeps saying the same thing over and over and you do that, especially back then, because today I'm here, tomorrow I'm down the road, and next week I'm, I'm over a lot farther away. Everybody ought to hear these stories that gets them in their mind. So Jesus tells a story that you've heard in a different context, but he uses it in a little bit different way when he says, okay, guys, what do you think? What do you think about this whole story about kids and how important they are and how careful you gotta be with them? And again, the guys are like, you tell us, Jesus. So Jesus says, okay, let me tell you a, a made-up story, right? You've heard this before. If a man has a hundred sheep, but one of the sheep gets lost, he wanders off, won't he leave the other 99 on the hills and go look for the lost sheep? To which I think they all go, yeah, we've heard this story before and we know the answer is yes, right? Now for us, I don't think any of us are worrying about whether we lose one sheep or not, Right? So here's what I want us to think about for a moment. I want us to think about credit cards, credit cards and kids. How many of you have ever lost a credit card? Or maybe, maybe was, we've misplaced it. Maybe that's a nice way to say it, right? And you know, as soon as you lose it, you know what happens, right? You don't go to your, your wallet or your billfold and look at your, your thing and, oh, I got, I, got, I got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven other credit cards. Right? We don't, we're like, no, no, this is the one. That's the one I use for this. And we, we get all worried. We start calling places. We start looking for stuff. We kind of just search all over the place, right? We don't, we don't look at all the cards we still have and go, well, I still got a bunch of cards. No problem, right? No, no, no. We're like, we all get kind of worked up, right? Same way with kids. If you got more than one and one of them gets lost, it's not like, well, at least I still got one. <laughs> Apparently the bright one that didn't get lost... Well, you got multiple, it's not like I got three other kids, so that's pretty good odds. Still got 75%, that's, you know. No, 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 you go search your free kid, right? And you go through all those emotions, right? <gasps> oh, and you start scrambling, start thinking worse stuff because that's where our mind goes. You start getting, you know, you go off and off and off and off. I mean, just think about credit cards and wallets and how we were, and kids, about how we respond in those moments when they are lost. In fact, he's even thinking about it. Our anxiety goes up a little bit, Right? Because like, oh man, you know, my credit's at risk and my, they could go spend stuff and if my credit, do I have a good credit card? That's not, gonna, you know, we'll, not pay, we'll pay back those things. And the kids are like, no, no, this is my kid. I, you know, losing one is like losing all of them, right? She right. says, okay, that's how you, that's the feeling I want. Okay, now let me tell you the truth. If he finds it, he's happier about that one sheep. He rejoices more about that one sheep than over the, all the other 99 that have never lost, that never wandered away, Right? all those credit cards that stayed there. You're happier about the one that you found, not about all the other ones you have. And half of them are at their limit, right? And the kids, you know, 
You're thrilled that you found him. I mean, oh, don't you ever do that again? You go through all those motions. Don't you ever do that again? You get mad at him. You're happy. You're sad. You're crying. The other one, knucklehead's over there just kind of like, you know. Apparently, I got to get lost to get attention around this place, right? <laughs> Here's what I love about this story. And that's that we've all stumbled. Yes. We've all gotten lost. In fact, some of you may be the reason you're here today. Or maybe the reason you're watching is somebody told you, hey, you ought to watch this, you ought to listen to this. And you've stumbled, and you're clear that you've stumbled. That life has gotten out of hand. Life has gone chaos, right? Maybe it's been your faith that's gotten shaken or broke apart. or sort of barely holding on. And so you, you came here today and you showed up today not knowing what to expect or kind of hopeful, but not even sure that, you know, God would be happy to have you here, that we'd be happy to have you here. Maybe you feel like you've just gotten lost, right? But you're, you, you came because you're looking for some kind of hope, some kind of thing that's gonna, gonna, gonna let you know that maybe, maybe, just maybe, there's a chance. And if that's your story today, I want you to hear something very clearly from me. And it's this. God is more excited about you today than, he, than God is excited about me today. And I get paid to be here. And I've been a follower of God for a long, long time. But I'm not disturbed by that. In fact, I'm glad that God is happier that you're here than I'm here. Because it means something has happened. It means there's some hope. It means that you haven't stumbled too much, that you haven't gotten too lost. Because what if, what if, what if God has always cared and looked for you? Same way we always care and look for our credit cards and our kids. I mean, I don't every day go look and see if I have all my credit cards. But when I pick up my wallet, I do kind of glance. And if I don't see the right colors, I get a little worried. And when I had kids at home, you know, it wasn't like every day I wanted to know everywhere where they're at. But, but you know, if they didn't show up times at certain places, well, I was kind of wondering how they're doing. I check on them, and, and there's just something comforting about all that. And then Jesus finishes his whole thought in this by simply saying this listen, in the same way, same way as the credit cards and kids, same way as the, the sheep and the one that wanders away, in the same way, your Father in heaven does not want, he's not willing that any of these little children to be lost, to be lost to him, to, to perish. And that ought to actually be good news for all of us. Because I just said a moment ago, we all stumble. We all get lost at times. And to put it in the context of the people that Jesus was talking to specifically 2,000 years ago, because the disciples were the closest people on earth to Jesus. At this point, they've spent probably three, over three years with him. Hearing his teaching, watching him do things, experiencing what it was like and, and learning and changing and having their picture adjusted multiple, multiple, multiple times. And even at this stage, they were stumbling. They were getting lost because they got so focused on themselves and where they were going to end up, what spot they were going to get. And we're maybe missing what Jesus has been trying to tell them over and over and over again. But it's not about you. It's about them. And whenever we make it about us, 
it always gets messed up. All right, let's wrap it up. What, what, if, what if there really are times when God cares more about us than we even care about ourselves? And what if, what if that doesn't always feel like care? My last thought to leave you with is simply this. That doesn't mean it isn't.